just so I let everyone know, I'm going to give uh, it about three or four more minutes. Uh, that'll give you time to read the note well and uh, perhaps get some caffeine in you. I know it's very late uh, for Xuping and Chung Fen. Uh, for Kayer, it's very early. So hopefully with enough caffeine, we will be a caffeinated discussion. Today, I hope we have quite a bit of discussion. Thank you for the comments on the list. I have tried to revise some of this text. Let's go ahead and get started this morning. Uh, first of all, for the record, please read the note well. This is an ITF interim. We are obeying all the interim information. We are also attempting to work more like a design team with plenty of comments and reading. Donald and I will be presenting this morning and um, you will be uh, hopefully giving us lots of good feedback. Good morning, Nan. Good morning, Nat, Randy Shuping, Donald Shuping, uh, Care, and Jeff. The participation, uh, by participating, you agree to follow ITF processes and policies. This includes uh, being aware that any ITF contribution is covered by patents. <clears throat> and patent applications that are owned, you need to report them. Read the rest of the um, slide on the note well. I'll give you just a moment. Hopefully you've all had a chance to read that. If you have any questions, about the note well, please either ask a chair or ask uh, the ombudsman. Uh, we're glad to help. Okay, we're going to dive right into uh, sharing uh, the design team three. Remember, we tried to break this into design teams meeting. We're trying to get con uh, comments on uh, 
the breakup of the original flow spec V2 spec into pieces. This morning's agenda is uh, a short review of the basic uh, IP, uh, flow spec for basic IP. We're trying to get to in this uh, May and June uh, something where we can get to a basic flow spec. The folks, uh, so I will go through that first. We're also going to cover what about actions in either extended community or path attribute, and then look to have discussions on what happens with actions or ordering. That's design team three's work. We're trying to figure out how to work on actions. Then there's design 14, and these are just four efforts where we look at non-IP filtering, filtering for MPLS or FSC. Donald will cover L2 VPN and tunnels. And we've done all of this work for a while. Now, these four design teams are looking at trying to get a basic IP. The basic IP flow spec is a smaller uh, is a small portion of the full flow spec material. Uh, we found that the full flow spec that we'd adopted as a working group was complete, which was our goal, uh, consistent, and for the most part workable. But the implementers came back with, "Wow, that's a lot to chew on for the first time." So what I'm trying to do in these interims, as both the co-author of the flow spec v2 spec and as a chair i'm trying to respond to those implementers by breaking it up into manageable chunks so the implementers can eat why do we want the implementers to have easily um, worked on chunks because idr requires two implementations to go to a standard so our real focus is do we have the right amount of information uh, functionality in the basic IP flow spec v2 spec? Our focus is currently to have the current v4 and v6 filters uh, from v1, current actions from the extended community, and ordering, user ordering. Uh, the feedback we got from uh, initial implementers. Uh, is that was enough just to add ordering. If you uh, are an operator and this is not enough, please let me know. Nat has been giving me some really good feedback. So is Nan and Chuping and Shang Fen. So the next thing, once we have this basic IP, then what we want to do is allow people to add things to it. So the new flow spec, basic model would be just these current v4 v6 filters plus the current actions plus user ordering that seems to have a better fit for some of the denial of service attacks then other people would add like to ask more ip filters our original flow spec v2 spec had some additional filters and so what we want to make it easy for people to do is to add those filters to this basic uh, flow spec V2. The other thing people wanted to add is they wanted to add more actions, actions which were ordered. And that we will discuss today as the more IP actions in flow spec V2. The non IP filters and actions, Donald did some great work, and we have some work for uh, MPLS and uh, SFC. So I'm going to dive right into Team 3's focus. Uh, previous interims have reviewed the basic IP and the more filters. I will give a very short. And so we've done three interims in April and May on this flow spec. We will repeat some of that in June hoping to go along with an adoption call for the flow spec v2 basic we'll see how we're doing in june we will review this at itf again 
the reason why we're doing this is we're seeing a lot of requests for flow spec v2 editions but uh people have been not sure how to frame them so let me briefly go through the basic uh flow spec v2 in case you were asleep uh or missed it uh because you're not you're most interested in actions remember that flow spec v2 is a combination of rules that are added to a firewall what we wanted to change from flow spec v1 is we wanted to be able to have user ordering and we wanted to have deterministic because while flow spec v1 allows you to order by component it doesn't allow user ordering so you have a user order and for debugging purpose there's an identifier that's because some people may want to identify certain uh, rule sets, maybe rule two, five, six, as something that goes with a particular customer. Uh, then we have a rule match condition and a rule action. The rules on top uh, identify the rule match. The action uh, could have an action order. At the extended communities, there is no action order. But today we're going to look at what happens if we have an action order. We have not included an action name at this point, feeling that people uh, didn't really have that as a positive. But I've left it here in case because it was part of our initial feedback. OK, what does the NLRI look like for the new flow spec v2 because flow spec v2 is going to be in a new nli from flow spec v1 you have an nli length and a bunch of tlvs each with that order identifier flow spec filter type now uh, we're trying in the basic to get a set of filter types that cover our current flow spec v1 work Last time I had proposed an order and based on feedback, I've changed everything past the filter rules, Donald's uh, L2VPN and tunnel traffic uh, is hierarchically uh, designed in fee one to, to link off of a particular type. But you notice we're trying to settle on uh, an initial set of types we initially set ip basic filter rules to be the filter rules from v1 v2 no additions the extended filter rules to have a version so we could add new filter rules and then mpls and l2 and ssft uh, filter rules i've reordered and tunnel traffic so this go this type goes in the flow spec v2 filter type and there's a type link value field which is follows okay if you look at uh, the components for the basic you would see that it has just component types for flow spec v1 and perhaps we'll add a TTL. There was, during our initial flow spec V2 work, a call for adding TTL field. Now, once we get to component numbers, those component numbers are based on the type. So for the IP component numbers, we have uh, IP components that we currently have. With the extended filter, we followed that numbering and added TTL, SID, and uh, SID in the IPv6 routing header and NRP. For non-MP, I've chosen to uh, put 64 and 65. These component numbers could be starting with zero. Uh, in the L2 VPN, they have indeed started with zero. Okay, that's my quick review. Any questions on the component numbers? That the component number uh, definitions are unique to the types. That we have uh, seven type, uh, six types defined, one reserved. 
And then additional types, should we change, uh, include them? Okay. Remember, as I just mentioned, that flow spec V2 of one and V1 are ships in the night. The general order of rule is the rule zero, which is the assumption, is permit all. Rule one to some n is the flow spec V2 with user ordering. And after that, we put flow spec V1 at a single user order number and ordered by components. Just as the last indication, if you have the same user order number, it's then ordered by component types. And if you have the same user order and component number, then you alt order by uh, the rules found in each component. Okay. Any questions on the base flow spec V2 discussion before I dive into IP actions? Okay. This is, that was all review. There are two types of actions, extended community actions, uh, where there, there have been in the past generic transitive extended communities, IPv4 transitive extended communities, and transitive IPv6 address specific. The difference between all of this has been the way people have defined it. Uh, there's a great deal of options on how to define extended communities. And certain drafts have picked uh, certain choices. More of the definitions for extended communities are in the generic transitive. Uh, some of the IPv6 require the additional space. The community path attribute is a path attribute that has been defined in the wide community draft, but it is a unique attribute with the flow spec V2. So the idea would be to define a flow spec community type and make the base header, which is just, uh, has, I will show you, followed by just the flow spec V2. So let's look at what's actually in the flow spec actions. Uh, one of the pro we have uh, flow spec traffic rate. Uh, we have by bytes, by packets. We have uh, traffic actions, copy or terminate the flow spec uh, choice. We have redirects. We have classifiers from SFC. This is a very small step of extended communities. Um, a lot of them having to do with redirecting denial of service attacks, rate limiting, or various things. In the, there is one problem. What happens if the year is a failure in an action? For example, if you want to mark something with the DSP and then redirect it, what happens if the DSP marking fails? Or what happens if your rate limit fails and you're sending it, you're redirecting it to something that can only handle so much rate? So one thing we need to discuss is something we'll call an action chain ordering. What happens? if something fails. So uh, keep that in mind. By the way, this is the format of the generic uh, transitive community, high byte, low byte, value of six bits. And for the IPv6, you have, uh, excuse me, for the transitive extended community, you'll have uh, flow spec interface set, which decides to, for a specific set of interfaces, uh, filter after you've uh, detected the interface and the direction. 
So interface set is a very interesting action in that it's set as an action, but really it groups, says this group of interfaces plus this uh, direction is what we're going to do. It's meant to work with a set of filters uh, or a set of uh, default filters such as dropped. We went through that in a bit of detail last week. I encourage you to read that as well. And again, for V6, you have the redirects. So let's talk about failure modes. In the failure modes we learned about in network management, for example, in the configuration from NetMod, NetComp, you have failures which uh, can occur. You can have a failure that causes you to want to stop all the rest of processing. For example, the failure to mark a DSCP uh, byte may cause you to want to stop processing or the failure to be able to rate limit a stream may want you to just stop processing. Uh, you may want to continue. Uh, you couldn't copy the uh, bytes, but you want to continue. You may want a conditional on a failure. Well, if it's this type of failure, stop, but if not, uh, go back. Uh, and you may have an all or nothing. In configuration, you have an all or nothing. I want all my configuration in, or I want to roll back. It's not sure how that might work in this network management. So has anyone ever had in a uh, network example the uh, uh, flow spec that by an implementation stops on failure? Have you seen that, Nat or Nan or Kay or Jeff? Yeah, so our implementation, if it can't install the rule, I will install basically a pass for the action. That way the rule actually continues rather than causes a block. <coughs> so this is a... Uh, implementation choice of uh, fail open rather than fail closed. Okay, so it's fail continue on uh, on failure. Do you continue to do other actions? Uh, so one of the things that uh, our implementation also doesn't do is that the combinations are not allowed to just completely intermix. We only support very specific things together with each other. So you get you know, very simple things like DSCP marking along with maybe another action like uh, you know, traffic rate limiting, that sort of thing. But uh, you, you start trying to arbitrarily mix things like redirect IP, redirect diverf, et cetera. Our implementation doesn't support the full combinations. My understanding is that other people do not support the whole combination of these act actions. They, uh, let me... Kair, do you know of any, uh, have you worked with the flow spec where these actions stop or fail? I think what Jeff explained was an accurate behavior. We have seen cases where we have had uh, interoperable, interoperable issues, uh, uh, particularly when you look at a bunch of uh, collectors or flow spec collectors, if you will, um, and, uh, and the controllers. And in those cases uh, of where the interoperability issues were arising, we've seen cases where, you know, uh, implementation, at least from our standpoint, would not install the filter. So pretty much what Jeff explained. Okay. Um, and yes, we also implement uh, relatively simpler ones, which is redirect to work or uh, redirect to interface or uh, attach a label and forward it so forth and so on but no complex rule sets no chaining okay yeah, I think another thing that's Look. worth uh, highlighting here so we're, we're talking about how at least two implementations do don't do complicated things right now and you know, part of that's just simply because you know the 
the specs have evolved basically a little bits at a time and you know <clears throat> the vendors are solving very specific use cases what is going to be sort of challenging as you work through the aco type stuff is sure you could have these very complicated rules about how things can go and what the behavior should be if it's not supported but the other half of the question for somebody trying to use flow spec is well, what does a given device in the network actually do support you know so as an example if you support you know four different types of actions and you don't support all combinations of them uh, it'd be nice for the controller to know that before it admits a flow spec route so that it doesn't try to send out nonsensical programming you know the aco just means that when you receive it you can at least do something that makes sense but the second half of it is uh the network needs to figure out what it can actually do there is the query on that um this aco extended community is trying to have us focus on that issue that jeff mentioned you have a whole bunch of of nodes, you're downloading flow spec into them, and you suddenly get a match that you expect, but the command doesn't work. What is the normal attitude that the controller that's sending on this uh, might do? The default would be stop on failure. Don't don't continue on. The default might be continue on failure, but this would say from a controller, I'm expecting this on, you're going to stop on failure. Nan says if some elimination actions fail, the simple action can be conducted for security analysis. Can you give us any more details on that, Nan? I don't know. I'll read your chat room if your uh, voice is problematic. Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, if uh, we, we, our controller detects some uh, attacks and we can install some elimination actions in our rotor um, and uh, together with the sample action. But uh, when we conduct the elimination actions, some of them are fail uh, uh, but uh, uh, what I mean is the sample action should be still conducted because our controller can use the sample the traffic to do a further analysis on the attack instead of stop on the failure okay that might be contentional stop on failure meaning a failure means you want to do a, a copy and that might be something you want to tell that your network that you're going to do a condition ask for a condition conditional stop on failure where you copy it and that would be uh number two um that's good to know that that's why that's in there nan is that i understood that some people were looking to it this this extended community gets added to a flow spec NLRI and says, this is what I'm going to do and passes along through a particular AS or AS confederations. As you know, at the edge of a network, many times things uh, get pulled off that are extended communities. And that might not be so bad in this case because it is really a uh extended it is something within a community or an as confederation uh policy might add stuff at the next edge but this is a proposal that i have in the in the basic draft to try to add this type of concept um anybody think this is a bad idea to add this particular uh thing to the uh, to the basic uh, functionality. Good morning, Yingzen. Um, okay, this will come back up. 
I will try to send out the queries. I've not gotten a lot of feedback, but perhaps uh, Jeff and I have been working on, and Jeff and Kaer and I and Shuping and maybe Nan have been working on this. You're not sure the act, at Randy brings up a very good point. I'm not sure the AC action failures are exclusive. That's an interesting point. Want to give me any more detail if, if, uh, how that might work, Randy? Stop plus roll back. Ah, uh, I got it. I had intended roll back, uh, to be stop and roll back. Uh, unclear. Thank you. Is there any others that are, um, Arc, but nah, okay. I should have had, thank you. That's a good correction. I should have had that as stop and roll back. Good point. Thank you, Randy. As always, you catch the important details. Um, okay, let me go on. I hope that you will think about uh, this. This is in, this is the one addition to the base proposal as a new extended community in response to what people have said. Okay, uh, let's look at how some of the generic uh, extended communities have been added to for non-IP. There is the addition of this ACO, which I think is a, a good basic. And then there have been additions for the MPLS stack that was included in the original flow spec V2 and the VLAN action and TPD action that are from uh, flow spec VN. It is my intent to pull those uh, MPLS, VLAN, and TIP off of the basics, but keep the action chain ordering. Now these non-IP can be added. It's just we're trying to get to a real uh, simple base spec. Donald always says to me when when working on a, a draft together, it's not how much you can add in, it's how much you can also take out to make sure there's a clear spec. So the first thing took out the flow spec in the community path header. It took out the user uh, ordering of actions. But I want to describe how that's working in case some people thought the ordered actions were important. The question that we'll come back to with ordering is what is the default ordering that we might use? Just a minute, let me go back. I think I've gotten to the right spec here. If you use a default ordering that says, I'm gonna order my actions, my flow spec actions, say, say I have a, a traf traffic right bait, uh, rate bite uh, action plus a, uh, redirect plus a remark that I'm going to order the actions uh, uh, that might be added to a particular filter. Remember, these communities might be added to a whole uh, group of filters in the LRI. I'm going to order the actions deterministically by number. That's the default actions. Uh, uh, the implementation might have a knob to say, I propose one versus the other. So one of the pro, what do, what do I mean by ordering? If you think of ordering of these actions, if you have traffic rate byte followed by uh, redirect followed by something, if, if multiple communities get added to an NLRI, how do you deterministically, meaning how do we time after time do the same thing with these actions? Uh, 
the idea is you have to have some basic order. You have to have some defaults and some abilities to user orders. Jeff, do you want to bring that up now or do you want to bring it up after I? Uh, after I think it's. I think it's probably better to do it now to give the problem and the, before we give the solution. Uh, sure. So part of the headache here is that uh, our extended communities is just a way to signal a thing, but it has you know, no context built into the operation. So uh, several of the things that we started off with, the base flow spec RFC, obviously apply to just what we have. And even those, we're starting to have combination issues. When we start adding in the additional features, which extend flow spec to start doing non-IP type things, you know, for example, interaction with service chains, tunnels, layer two headers, MPLS, et cetera, we start getting into actions that only make sense, you know, uh, in some cases against very specific layers. So like an SFC classifier obviously should only go with the SFC, you no know, feature you know, as part of its work. Uh, VLANs would you know, be something that you'd address as part of the uh, you know, layer two type things. But you start getting some of these weird hybrid cases where you do things like tunnels or you're doing uh, you know, redirections to things that are not just redirect IP, but maybe cha change encapsulation. And in those cases, you start having the issues of, well, if I have a VLAN operation and I'm uh, doing an L2 interaction uh, and this is a tunnel, Am I interacting with you know, the inner encapsulated uh, thing or the outer encapsulated thing if you're doing certain types of, uh, for example, you know, tunnels across data centers? So examples of how these things sometimes are layer specific, sometimes they cross layers and uh, there's not enough information available or space available inside of a extended community to address what layer that we're doing. So, okay. Uh, I think for my next attempt at this, I may try some specific examples. I went to the summary format. Okay, so because you have these uh, actions that we've had in the past that can interact, we uh, the suggestion was that we go to something where we could order them. And the, there's no space in the extended community, so we look toward a path attribute, which is for communities. It's in the wide community draft, but the basic uh, path attribute for communities is a fairly simple. It has a TLV within it. It has flags, and then it would have the action TLVs. These flags, um, help us in that they discuss whether it's transitive across confederation boundaries or across AS boundaries. And that can give a hint to those networks who are pulling and getting rid of uh, communities. And, and that's a, a common thing. So what would the actions look like inside? Well, there would be a common action TLV header to give some action order. Okay, uh, there's a global action order on it that's one, two, three, and perhaps a dependency chain ID. Now, dependency chain uh, is a more complex thing. Uh, for example, um, you might want to do the SFC actions followed by the VLAN actions, or you might want to say, okay, uh, I'm going to redirect uh, and do S uh, DSP, uh, CP. The dependency chain would say, okay, chain this to the other uh, actions. And then you have a sequence of sub TLVs, the action, the length, um, type and value, where they can be actual actions. So you notice with this format, there's a lot of complexity in, in that has been requested in the actions, uh, but there's a lot of work to do to see if we have the right forms for the things that people do. So one question will be, 
what do you do and does this type of user ordering work? Here's examples that we've seen in proposals. Now, this first one was done based on the community path attribute for wide, but it shows functionality that's that's working. They want to met, match and set an attribute. The attribute uh, can be a grouping, could be a community. Uh, there's a match and don't advertise. That was a set of functionality shown by the RPD draft. There is a, a draft coming out of the debt network to have a deterministic latency action forward, but put it in this queue or map to this TSD stream where these actions have certain functionality that have more parameters. This is not the complex case of the highly dependent, uh, excuse me, where multiple actions have dependencies. This action proposals are the simple, where there's simply not enough space to give uh, the details. So if I don't, any questions on the ones that we found that have just simply need for more space than the extended community has? Any, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, so at least half the headache here is that most of the actions can be encoded in something like an extended community in terms of space. It's the ordering semantics. You know, you're you're trying very hard uh, to supply some of that, but extended communities are severable, which means that uh, those different routers are able to manipulate the things inside of them without you know caring about uh, the whole package. So, trying to accomplish the order requirements in an extended community, I think, is an interesting challenge. Yes. The only ordering that one can do with extended communities is uh, how is that you could have a default order. And the default, even if you put in a default order for the basic one, there's going to want to have implementations that say, that's not my order, give me a knob. Um, but it is the challenge that we had because order depend really impacts these actions. So that's our first challenge is order for if it works and then order for success and failure. And uh, dependency, when you modify the packet, um, new proposals from CATS, um, uh, Savnet, um, and and even uh, fall along the line of the DSCP. We're going to modify the packet, and then we're going to do something with it later. So, Nat, do you want to give your example? I thought it was a really helpful example about what happens when you modify the packet. Would you be willing to walk it through? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, so, um, for example, that oh, uh, the packet that with DSCP zero that is the first row, row one hundred, and if we do some actions on row one hundred, which uh, we set DSCP to four, and go to for example, if we have a go to action, then go to row four hundred, then for row four hundred is matching against DSCP four. So, um, if uh so um when when do we do the action uh we'll uh we'll have different uh, we'll uh uh the rule 400 will hit uh will have different outcomes if uh, uh which is decided by uh when do we apply the actions to the the packet uh if we apply that just after rule 100 for each, uh, then the packet will be modified to this before. So rule 400 will match the packet and do something else. And if we 
accumulate all actions for the matching rules and do it at the end, then rule 400 will not match that packet. So yeah, we might need to consider that uh, behavior for each rule. So yeah, that's it. Yes. Um, now, Nat yeah. has a concept of a go-to rule 400. Uh, as Jeff says, that's quite a jump from today. But the one thing that his example brings out in a short form is what when do you when do you do the the actions in my mind as i've been writing the spec you do you get you hit a match you do an action you change the packet the packet as it continues through the actions is actually then modified most of the specs i've read seem to have that uh that uh, concept that you match the packet and then you go on. Uh, if you don't, that's a really, your packet, uh, your packet has different changes. So if one implementation does it while you uh, immediately and another implementation does it when you bundle them all up, there's a problem. Um, uh, do you want to mention your comment, Jeff? In uh, sure, the whole point of putting in the comments is to see where they fit in the flow. So, uh, go to and accumulation both have some interesting consequences when we're talking about uh, firewalls distributed by flow spec. The whole point of flow spec is that we're distributing these routes in BGP, and that means that they're subject to BGP distribution headaches. So if you're doing a static piece of firewall configuration, you know, you spend a lot of your energy as a firewall administrator trying to make sure you have all the rules in the right order installed appropriately uh, and do a atomic commit on them. Because if you mess up the ordering, if you mess up the capabilities, or you do something else, well, you start throwing away traffic or doing you know the wrong stuff. With flow spec, there's no guarantee that you have all the rules at any given period of time. So there, there's sort of a rule uh, rule set atomicity that's not present in the base flow spec protocol, or even the stuff we're talking about for flow spec v2. You know, we're getting these things one at a time. And for the original DDoS cases, that was mostly OK. You know, even for the mostly OK cases, if you had dependent rules, well, if you didn't have the dependent rules present all at the same time, or if you have, as we've talked about in the last couple of interims, installation problems, the headache that you have is that uh, you, you don't even get for a specific set of impacted traffic a level atomicity. So. This is just sort of highlighting flow spec right now doesn't deal with this atomicity, you know, the same level that a, a firewall would. If we move this to the uh, discussion of uh, the store with accumulation, you know, in a firewall, if you're saying, you know, take action A, then action B, then action C, well, that's configuration. Depending on exactly what you're doing, uh, the things may be input on separate you know, lines but they end up compiling down to a single operation in the firewall because you're trying to minimize the number of passes through the firewall infrastructure. And if you don't have it passing through the same rule, you end up having a flavor of uh, either the pa uh, packet gets examined by further firewall terms, or in some cases uh, may actually require a packet recirculation in order for that to take effect. So that just in terms of accumulation, you have to be very careful what you want to accumulate and what you expect the sort of performance impacts to be. And the second half of this is highlighted by the go-to. You know, if you have these things uh, that need to actually have the full set of them, so if you're accumulating rules A, B, C, D, well, if you don't happen to have rule D at the time that uh, the packet's hit the, the network, you're going to process A, B, C, hopefully that's okay. Or if D can't be implemented by a subset of the devices, you know, hopefully that's okay and go to is the same way. If you don't happen to have rule 400 on your system, what's the ex expected behavior? You know, how, how do you basically make sure that the program is complete and 
you know, with these things being distributed as BGP routes, I'm not sure that's a good assumption we should start with. And Sue, your mic is not on. Excuse me. Uh, my apologies. We're uh, I'm going to pick us up on. So we're in the midst of discussing several questions uh, that I need you all to think of because it's if you've got experience like Nat and Nan and Shifeng and and Yingxin and uh, Donald and Chi, you, you have experience about what happens when things go wrong. Um, so uh, some of what Jeff and I are trying to bring up are these basic questions. What happens when actions interact the, in the extended communities? Um, the default is to pass all the traffic. Um, the default filter match was to drop, uh, but we have known interactions between communities. We can work beyond it, as Jeff was just describing, using user uh, set actions, uh, but this complexity is challenging and has some of its other things. So. We'll first uh, implementation or the first basic will focus on the interactions inherent in extended communities. And in the specs, we find that there are the functions that are listed there. A lot of them interact, the traffic base, the traffic action, the redirects, uh, they all interact. We currently now the implementations deal with it themselves by not letting multiple uh, actions interact by streaming off communities, uh, taking them off the packets. Yes, Nan, uh, the go to may be to evaluate the next. So that really brings us to what does the spec say? Uh, currently, the the implementers say, I just want to do what I'm currently doing now. The problem with that that we had is what one person's currently doing now is not what another person is currently doing now. And that has led to problems. There are two ways around it, go by order, uh, have, excuse me, three ways, go by order, uh, have a single action only, um, you know, buyer beware with, you know, the current situation. Uh, that's true. There's also interactions in V6, so you can't just go to V6. We really have, um, yes, uh, do you want to mention the terminal action, Jeff? Go ahead. I know, just that we already have one. Yes, you can. The terminal action says, "Okay, stop with this one. Don't go further if you got it." Um, so all of these interactions are currently a problem, and where we started out to try to get a user or a user-defined order that we could pass in a community or a community path attribute, this is the order I want my actions to do. And that that will solve the problem. You know, the flow spec of ET could solve the problem with user order actions to fix this problem. However, the feedback is I can't get to community path attributes. What can you do on extended communities? So we've given the, the option of the action chain ordering. We've given 
the default ordering for numbers. We need some sort of feedback uh, from implementers and from you all as people who know what happens when the network has problems. Uh, I'm going to ask you to think about it, but if anybody has any experience. Uh, one of the problems with it is you may only want to order certain communities. Uh, Care, I think you said you only did certain orders of communities. That's correct. Right. And uh, do you, is that by application or is that by general flow spec V2? Uh, excuse me, flow spec rules. Um, it's by general flow spec rules. We have adhered to the flow spec RFC as much as possible. Okay, so the flow spec V1 RFCs does not uh, cut out any of the actions, but it it uh, does have the terminate function, which some people say, okay, you got here, stop processing. Uh, but the terminate function has problems. The more that I pull on the threads here, folks, the more that I say, okay, is flow spec external communities good enough for the basic IP, the more someone pulls out a particular problem. Uh, G, do you want to mention yours uh, verbally, the go-to? Yeah, uh, my in my understanding, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. You're loud and clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in my understanding, the the go to uh, rule changed some of these existing uh, flow spec filters operation. Like uh, currently, we use and uh, between all the filters, right? But the go to allows you to skip some of the filters just to, to go to some. Uh, to jump to some uh, filters uh, maybe at the bottom. So this is uh, a uh, change to me compared it is to a the change. existing. Yeah. It is a change. The, the, the current filters add up. The idea is you start with a right. full stream of data and then you cut down the stream based on the filters. Uh, the terminal action that st says stop filter stop processing at this point tends to stop the thing, but it doesn't. The AND is a guaranteed uh, function because all you're doing is cutting down the flow further and further. Uh, the requests for go to right. are scary. Thank you, G. Okay. But we've had requests for that different ordering for skipping. Uh, we're giving you a lot. Of, the proposal that's in there is very, uh, in flow spec V2, is to go in order of the community, extended communities by the type. Uh, that's just a default order. Um, to still obey the ter terminate and to uh, perhaps add this action chain ordering. That's the basic. Uh, OK. I think we've gone through the action failure. Uh, what I've given you some examples of some actions that can't be added by extended communities. Uh, one of the things we've seen, I've seen in the proposals is uh, lack of space for parameters and dependencies. Dependencies is a very uh, complex concept that is saying I want to do action one and then if it succeeds, I want to do action two, but if not, if it fails, I want to go to action four. And Nat's example 
I don't know if it works without dependencies because if rule one works and let's see if I can bring up, no, I'll just go, uh, Nat's example has different actions based on whether um, you have it. The dependency is that rule one matches, you set the DSCP and then the rules follow. So there is a dependency on correct actions based on what you set. That's one way of looking at dependency. Dependency can get highly complex. Okay. Um, the path, so I'm going to stop there. Have I missed any of the discussion on actions? Um, it sounds like that I need some really good use cases to talk this through. I used the simple one from Nats and the verbal ones that we've been doing. Any suggestions how we can work through a minimal set? Okay. Uh, I'll try to work through some examples uh, where uh, the, the, the actions in the community path attribute uh, we will pick up in the future uh, because we're focusing on getting the actions. But if you go to that, you have a whole bunch of questions about uh, how you handle the community. But we'll pick that up. I've, I've listed these questions and we, as Nan's example, Nat's example gives us, we need to have some understanding of dependency. Okay, I'm going to pick up the second piece of slides from, uh, the, from the non-IP stuff. There is in the uh, Flowspec V2 original, an MPLS set of uh, filters uh, and actions. And so I'm going to briefly go over that. Then Donald's going to take the rest of the time to go through the L2 VPN and the Flowspec tunnels. The non the filters I mentioned, there was a label match based on the actual label, which gives you range for before, after, uh, they're just uh, the same type of ranges you have in IP. That's what the operator does. And then it has a matching on experimental bits. The SFC does not have any match filters. So with that, Donald, I will go to your uh, L2VPN. <clears throat> okay. Um, Let's see. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to really need all, all the time you've allocated to me, but. Uh, okay. Whatever. Well, uh, <laughs> just uh, tell me and I'll. Uh, do you want me to run the slides or sure, I can you can do that on the slides. Okay. Uh, so uh, these are these two graphs, one of which is uh, general, uh, really layer two, and also layer two inside VPN, and the other is really general tunneling. The file names are somewhat more specific. In the, List of authors here is a merger of the author list for the two drafts. Uh, next slide. So this is a sort of document dependency thing, uh, showing what uh, components and things uh, each of the, uh, the the two drafts do use that are defined in other uh, documents. I think that's uh, reasonably straightforward. Uh, next slide. So initially talking about the uh, quote L2 VPN. So it, it really covers uh, non VPN cases. Uh, and what it does is uh, extends the SAFI 133 to uh, AFI 2, which is, AFI 6 rather, which is the one which is defined for 
Uh, I think it says uh, 802 is sort of the name of that, AFI, and it meant to include Ethernet uh, in general. And it um, also extends and renames uh, SAFI 134, which is currently defined in the registry as L3 VPN dissemination of flow spec rules. There's no particular reason for that SAFI to be restricted to layer three. So it just renames it VPN and it uh, allows it to be applied for uh, AFI 25. So anyway, uh, it provides various uh, optional matching on uh, L3 headers that appear after the L2 headers. So the main thing is it adds is matching on the L2 headers, but you can also uh, add that uh, to require also to match uh, following L3 headers. And it defines uh, 13 uh, match components in a new registry and two new actions, which are defined as extended communities. So this draft is past working group last call and is uh, awaiting implementations. Uh, next slide. So uh, this is what this looks like, the uh, NLRI. So if you, you have the VPN case, there's a routing discriminator to indicate the VPN that you're trying to match the traffic uh, inside. Um, and if you just want to match directly on the traffic, uh, not uh, in a VPN, you can, uh, that is not uh, present. So it depends on the SAFI. Uh, so uh, the ordering of the other fuels is a little odd. The next thing is an AFI, uh, which is two bytes. And then there's the L2 flow spec length and the L2 flow spec. Uh, and it is all, the, this draft is written to be kind of general. It allows the null case. Uh, not sure just how useful that is in all cases, but whatever. Uh, and whether or not there's an L3 uh, flow spec, and you can tell how long it would be from the overall length and the length of the previous fields. Whether that's there or not is sort of indicated also by the L3 AFI. So you, AFI zero is reserved. It means you know, that there isn't anything there. Uh, I mean, it's generally reserved for all purposes. That AFI zero is a reserved value. And it would indicate there's no, no match on layer three stuff after the layer two uh, headers that you're, you're matching. Next slide. So these are the components that are added. Uh, I think these are mostly pretty straightforward, uh, either type, source and destination MAC, uh, DSAP and SAP are the destination and source service access points, which is if you have the LLC format where you have these uh, access point, uh, base, uh, protocol identifiers, I wanna say. Uh, VLAN ID, uh, I'm not, there's a typo there. Sorry, that means should, uh, then there's the, uh, the VLAN uh, priority control uh, point, uh, which is the priority value. Uh, there's a three bit priority in the VLAN tag. And that's uh, those by implication of the outer ones. And there's the inner VLAN ID and inner one if you have double tagging, which is uh, quite common. There's also a drop eligibility bit uh, in there. And exactly what that does differs a little bit by different and different implementations, but you can check that. And then uh, these days there's uh, a uh, redefinition of all, sort of, uh, it's currently optional of uh, some of the bottom bits of the first byte of the MAC address. It's always been the case that there's a multicaster or actually officially called group cast, which includes both multicast and broadcast uh, bit. And that's of course still there. And then there was a local bit, but they've added a couple more bits. And there's this optional uh, thing uh, where you have can have uh, different subsets of what were the local uh, addresses and have some of those be uh, MAC addresses that are allocated by uh, a local protocol for, for uh, distributing uh, uh, MAC addresses or things like that. Anyway, these are basically tests on these bottom bits of the first byte of the MAC address, which may be more convenient than doing a check on the entire MAC address. Uh, next slide. 
So there's those communities, which are used in the level layer two act, uh, matching. And then there's two actions that are added. And I probably should, maybe should have had slides for these. Uh, the first one is called VLAN action. And uh, <clears throat> it basically is a uh, extended community that enables you to encode uh, various operations on the uh, VLANs. Um, and it assumes you might have you know, single or double tagging. So you can do things like uh, push another VLAN tag onto the frame, cause it to be inserted after the MAC addresses and before the rest of the frame, and quite, quite likely before an already existing VLAN tag or, or not. Uh, you can swap the inner and outer VLAN tags. You can pop the top level VLAN tag off of the frame. And uh, interestingly enough, if you look at the definition of this VLAN action, I'm wondering if I can actually uh, share a screen from my machine. Uh, does that work? Uh, uh, maybe not. Uh, let's see. Uh, not sure how that would work. Oh, well, you know. Anyway, uh, if you go look at this thing, you can actually, there's actually, uh, it's actually a double action. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, you can do two such actions as I was speaking about. So by, uh, you know, combining these things, you can, you could swap the uh, inner and outer VLAN, and then you could replace the outer VLAN with a different one. Uh, you could do a, a variety of interesting things. Uh, with the VLAN uh, action. Um, and uh, that's sort of interesting because uh, it doesn't actually talk in the draft about what happens if you're trying to do something and uh, that assumes there's two VLANs and there's actually only one. Actually, the draft only refers to the outer and the inner. So I guess maybe if you have only one VLAN, they both refer to the same one, which is interesting. Uh, the other action it has is a TPID. That stands for a tag protocol ID. So, uh, it, you know, people may be well aware that a standard uh, C VLAN is Ether type 8100. Um, there is also this service VLAN, which is 88 uh, alpha 8 uh, Ether type and hex. And if you look at the 802.1 specs, uh, you would never have two, C, two CV lands in a row. It's clearly not allowed by the 802.1 specs, even though everybody does it. And you, if you want to have two VLANs in a row, you have to have a service VLAN followed by a customer VLAN, an SVLAN followed by a CV LAN. So uh, maybe there are pieces of equipment that uh, enforce that. There's also the fact that I, I don't remember the exact details, but I believe early on, uh, the service VLAN concept, when it was first being proposed, was illustrated by using EtherType 9100 instead of an analogy to the 8100. And in fact, many people use 9100 for the service VLAN. In fact, EtherType 9100 has never been allocated. And at this point, it was sort of it's a kind of a poison VLAN. And if anybody ever used it, it probably wouldn't work very well because uh, a lot of other other pieces of equipment might interpret it as a service VLAN. Uh, nevertheless, uh, 802.1 steadfastly refuses to reserve that ether type because it was never officially allocated. So they ignore the common use of it. So anyway, if you you have you might easily have something coming along with some uh, VLAN tagging and it, be about to forward it to other equipment which would like a different ether type. Uh, to be able to recognize that VLAN. So the TP ID action lets you change the ether types indicating the VLAN. And actually it's generally, you could plunk an arbitrary ether type there, but it, it's likely to cause problems if it's not a, a um, VLAN one. And the Trill has uh, fine grained labeling. Uh, basically Trill uh, initially proposed using double tagging with C VLAN, but since that violates the 802.1 standard, even though everybody does it, 802.1 insisted that the, that the Trill standard couldn't say that. So Trill ended up uh, burning another ether type to, to generate the Trill fine-grained label so that it could uh, specify double tagging uh, with its own ether type 
under IETF control rather than trying to use the CVLAN ether type, which is under IEEE control. Anyway, more than enough about the TPID action. It's for changing the ether type on the VLAN tags. Uh, next slide. Uh, so that's basically uh, the whole story. I've uh, covered the things that are in the L2 VPN. Uh, let me just talk about a little bit more about that. So it basically comes along and it uh, matches uh, against the L2 headers with the various components there. And if you've indicated it can match the level layer three beyond that, it's written pretty generally. So you can, in fact, uh, have no layer two matching. Uh, in which case it always matches. And why would you want to do no no layer two and only layer three matching? You could encode that as a as a regular flow spec perhaps more easily, but maybe there's some piece of equipment which will only allow you to use these VLAN operations if it's uh, the AFI SAFI that indicates uh, the layer two stuff should be uh, available. So, uh, you know, it might be reasonable to in that case, to have uh, this, uh, use the FE SAFI for the layer two, even if the layer two matching is null, and you're only matching on layer three, but then having doing an action on VLANs, which are kind of a layer two thing. Uh, anyway, moving along to the NVO3, uh, initially was oriented just towards uh, some of the things from the NVO3 working group, but it, it covers uh, currently uh, a wide variety of tunnel types, and it's uh, easily uh, extendable for other uh, tunnel types that people want to do. Um, and there's, but there's specific mention of the uh, all the types listed in the on this slide for in terms of tunnel types. Uh, it it uh, lets you do um, component matching and so forth on the tunneling header fields, and also on headers that are beyond the the tunnel header. Uh, and of course, it's indicated by uh, Afi Safi and the uh, in, in the top level Afi Safi indicate the what outer header you're trying to match, and then there's a, you know, a provision for the uh, header. So the the Safi to indicate this is 77, and uh, the outer one would be indicate IP V4, IPv6, or you could do a layer two matching on the outside if you want. Uh, this draft creates a new registry for the tunnel header components. I, I think I mentioned uh, there's also one for layer two components uh, created by the first draft. And it's also has passed working group last call and is awaiting implementations. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what it looks like. Uh, there's an overall length. There's the uh, tunnel type, which it uses an existing tunnel type uh, registry, I believe. Uh, then there's uh, an octet of flags. Uh, with, currently, there are only two flags defined there, so there's six bits that could be assigned for some purpose. Uh, one bit indicates that it's the VPN case, and in that case, there is the uh, routing discriminator. <clears throat> A eight byte, byte routing discriminator is present to indicate the VPN. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then there's the uh, length and the outer flow specification. Uh, which depends on the outer, the AFI, uh, and the, then just the length plus the tunnel header flow specification. And in, in either case, if those are are null, uh, they would always match. Uh, and, and whereas the two are anded together. And then uh, whether or not you want to match things after the tunnel header, uh, there it's indicated by a bit in the flags. That's the uh, I indicates there's an inner flow specification. So uh, if that's present, then you have to provide an, an AFI for that uh, and the length and the interflow specification. So uh, that's the overall structure. Uh, next slide. So these are the uh, components it defines, which are all for matching headers. In some cases, the component is applicable to more than one tunneling type if they are the same sort of thing. Like uh, basically, the first thing there, VN ID is variously called VSID or VNI, depending on whether you're using uh, VXLAN or whatever. And uh, basically, it's the tenant ID. 
other, in some cases I've annotated these as to uh, which tunnel type they apply to. Tunnel header flags, almost all tunnel headers, if the tunnel header is, if there is a non-null tunnel header, uh, do have some flags in them. So there's this one component type for matching against those. No reason to have different component types for different uh, kinds of tunnels. And then the rest is all fairly straightforward. Um, I don't even offhand immediately remember what NS and NR stand for, but if you go look at the L2TP V3 spec, it defines what they are there. Uh, next slide. So here's an example. So this is uh, IP and IP, which is a kind of example where there's a null tunnel header. So you got IP and IP, whether it's, you know, whatever combination of version four and version six it might be, uh, there's no nothing between them. Um, and you would have these provisions where you can match on the outer IP header, uh, depending on the view of you specify uh, AFI one or two, or if you specify AFI uh, six, you can match on the L2 headers and then optionally match on the outer IP header. Uh, and then there's the uh, optional, you can have an inner flow spec to match on the inner IP header, including the inner uh, things like uh, the UDP or TCP headers and things like that. Uh, there's a question, Let's see. Uh, oh, oh, that's not related to this. Uh, so that's a very simple example, uh, something you can do with the, uh, what's specified in this draft. Uh, the next slide, please we'll give it a slide any more. So this is a VXLAN. So uh, very similar uh, in the VXLAN, there's always a UDP header. Uh, and so you can match on the outer IP and UDP header. Uh, you can optionally have, uh, if you've selected it, you could have match on outer L2 stuff if you want. Then there's the VXLAN header itself. So that it has uh, the tunnel header, flow spec and the components there. Usually fairly simple, I think match against things in the tunneling header. And then optionally, you could have an inner header to match against uh, the fields that are uh, after the VXLAN. So VXLAN is uh, defined to have an, an Ethernet header after it. So there's uh, basically Ethernet fields there. And uh, you could possibly match on the IP header after that optionally if you wanted to. So those are a couple examples there. Uh, next slide. I think that's uh, most of the material I have. Uh, here's the summary chart. Okay. So <laughs> this is a little uh, full of a smaller print here. This shows the different documents down the left. Uh, actually, the first two are RFCs, not drafts. And then uh, for various SAFIs across the top, uh, what uh, you need to, what you can specify there for the various uh, Afi Safi combinations, and uh, down the right is what the components that are sort of defined by that draft. So you have the there's the IPv4 and the IPv6 component types and the RFCs. Uh, the L2 VPN adds the L2 flow spec component types, and uh, the flow spec NVO3 draft adds the tunnel header uh, component types. So I believe that's uh, my presentation. And I'd be happy to answer questions to the extent that I can. Thank you, Donald, for the presentation. Jeff, is, go ahead with your questions. So, Donald, uh, this is past last call. <clears throat> and question I guess I have is uh, implementations. Are you aware of any at the moment? Uh, not right now, no. So okay. I, I guess this moves to the interesting question of, uh, so you're basically saying here, here's an embedded 8955 uh, flow spec inside of the L2 as the example. What do you think should happen to your current document when we do flow spec V2 and get a different MLRI format? Uh, well, I would say that, well, these, these documents are, I think they'll be free one around for a while, so these documents hopefully will be implemented and 
perhaps should go through, but in, in terms of what's incorporated in full spec B2, uh, I think these are capabilities should be included, but there's no reason for the formatting to be, uh, you know, the, at all the way it is here. Uh, I'm not sure what the, the right way to do it is uh, and how, you know, there's a temptation, of course, of going to a new version to make things more general, <laughs> but uh, which might be good. Like the, the, these uh, things allow effectively nesting where you have a flow spec inside uh, another flow spec uh, almost. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> this only goes two layers, but <laughs> you can imagine more, more than that or something. But uh, it's not clear that that's really uh, useful. Uh, I don't know. Oh, that's, that's sort of the double motivation for my question. So flow spec V1, part of the problem with the, the format there is that we have no ability to add additional stuff in there. So, so as an example, like TTL, we couldn't add TTL to the IP stuff with flow spec V1. The, you know, protocol uh, format does not permit it. So if uh, the L2 mechanism you're defining wanted to be able to match on TTL, it can't use you know, the flow spec version one stuff. It would actually have to upgrade itself to flow spec version two. So that's yeah, one aspect. I might, I might mention that all these components are TLV. They all have lengths, but go ahead. The, the newly defined ones, the layer two components and the uh, tunnel header components. Yep, and that's great. That was sort of uh, early proof of concept for what we're discussing here today for flow spec V2. Uh, it was mostly the encapsulated flow spec uh, you know, V1 for the layer three match that I I'm talking about. Okay, yep, that's true. Okay, and I guess the, the second half of the, the question is part of what we're looking at as the broader flow spec V2 work is trying to do at a very generic level to some extent what you're doing in these two documents, you know, be able to look at uh, tunneled content as an example. Uh, do you find it possible that uh, if we come up with a good format and there's no implementations of your uh, existing format, is there a motivation to move to the new format or, you know, where, where do you I'm, see that going? I'd be happy to consider that. I mean, yeah, I, uh, okay. if there's a better way it, to express it uh, until, Publication is requested. Uh, if the working group is, decides to okay. uh, improve these drafts, they can do that. Okay, no objections. That was the, the question I was looking yep. to get the answer to. Thanks. Yeah. That takes us to the end of our presentation for the actions and the non IP uh, work. We'll start these again in. Um, June, uh, please watch the mail list. We will follow the uh, order given in our presentation. Just a minute, I'll bring up that set of slides so you can see it. It'll be starting on June 3rd and it'll run for three weeks. So I hope that you will join us. I hope you will give us some feedback on. Uh, what we should do. Uh, the base IP is the real key thing. We need to know where we that uh, we have the actions designed correctly for the base IP, that we're solving the problems that FlowSpec V1 had with interactions between actions and ordering. I will bring that up on the list and see if we can work on that. The whole purpose behind these design teams have been to try to dig into the basic and see if we can actually get the basic out and uh, approved as a working group draft. The chairs will look at that and see if we can start a, a working group adoption call. All of this, uh, thank you for your time and I wish you to have a good day. Anything else, Jeff or Kayer? All good. Thank you. Nothing here. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.